Hi everyone, welcome to the London Machine Learning Meetup. Uh, we're going to make a start now. So I'm Martin Goodson. Um, I'm going to be hosting um, along with Giuseppe Paolo, pa pa Paolo from um, both of us from the company that support the meetup, Evolution AI. Um, and the talk is going to be by Sasha Roche from Cornell Tech and Hugging Face. Um, Sasha's going to talk for 30 or maybe 40 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion facilitated by Max Bartolo, um, who's from UCL. So I think if you've been here before, you, you probably know how it works. Um, we're going to use the QA function in Zoom to collect your questions. So if you could actually put your questions into the QA while Sasha's speaking, that's the, probably the best way of doing things. Um, and then we go straight into the discussion and start start taking your questions. Uh, and I'll give you a bit more information about how to do that um, after Sasha has finished speaking. So I'm gonna hand over to Sasha now um, and uh, you see you after uh, his talk. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Sasha Rush. Um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, work we've been doing in my research group on deep probabilistic structure in NLP, and particularly talk about how this relates to uh, a function I think everyone knows and loves, which is the softmax function. Um, before I begin, let me give a brief overview of what I work on. Uh, so my research group works in deep learning and natural language processing. Um, I, uh, I guess, uh, kind of split between both of those communities. Uh, we mainly publish in NLP conferences, but I was um, the general chair last year for ICLR, which is a conference in deep learning. Uh, deep learning has been obviously incredibly influential in natural language processing, so it's an area we're all very interested in. Um, my past work has looked into methods for summarizing text, for character-based uh, models, and for efficient natural language processing. Um, efficient NLP is an area I'm very interested in, and I know an area that um, many people in industry are interested in. Um, and uh, recently I've been doing um, a lot of work with Hugging Face, uh, where I work uh, as, um, I guess, like research director, although it's a startup, so it's pretty small. Um, and uh, there we do a lot of work on efficient transformer modeling and other aspects of um, making transformer easy and fun to utilize. Um, and uh, I guess I, I work there, but I'm also a heavy user of the product. So uh, I, I come with both hats uh, in, in that regard. Um, and then um, uh, I do a lot of side projects. Um, so uh, other areas that you might want to check out if you're interested in kind of applied um, machine learning for NLP is um, uh, we have a, a, a system um, that we've we, we worked on called uh, Name Tensor. Uh, which is a style of writing a more, uh, let's say, more easy to read, safer code in deep learning libraries like Torch. Um, I also have a course online that I've been developing called Mini Torch, where you can build a little version of Torch from scratch. Uh, each assignment uh, kind of builds you up into making it real. Um, other areas I've worked on are kind of tools for virtual conferences. Uh, we run a lot of the machine learning conferences on a toolkit we built called MiniComp. Um, and uh, another kind of fun tool online is uh, uh, Glitter, which is a tool for determining uh, whether text was generated from uh, a, a machine-based language model or from a human. Cool. Uh, so those are the kind of um, projects I work on. Uh, but today I'm going to give a research talk. And I want to talk about a question that's been bothering me, um, which is when we teach a model like Transformer, which has become the dominant model in natural language processing, how should we teach it? What can we say about what the model's doing and how it works? Um, and one way you can teach it is to teach it imperatively. We can look at the code from a library like Hugging Face Transformers and step through each line and see what parts are connected to what parts. Um, we can say that, well, uh, E1 is connected to E7 through some of these lines, and E4 is connected to E2 through some lines, and everything gets fed in with these token embeddings uh, that roughly encode the position of each of the points in the system. Um, 
And while this is really helpful from an engineering point of view, it doesn't really help us much from a scientific point of view. And I would argue that really what we know about uh, Transformer is that it does this. You give it some language and it gives you back some vectors. The vectors are fully connected to each other and the model can really learn kind of arbitrary transformations of anything it was given to anything it produces back. Um, and we have different names for the different blue boxes, but they all kind of can be represented in this form. Um, and so uh, what motivates me is this question of how do we build models that try to produce a more manipulable structure? How can we get some sort of abstraction that either explicitly exposes or uh, explicitly imposes some sort of conditional dependency constraints? And when I say this, I don't mean I don't want to use all the best tools from deep learning that we have available. I, I really want the maximum use of all this good stuff. I want pre-training, I want neural parameterizations, but I also want some ability to specify these conditional constraints. And I think this kind of core idea is behind lots of ideas in NLP these days. We want to improve robustness, we want to improve control, and we want to control inference speed. Um, and I think to do this, we're going to need some sort of uh, these constraints. So um, that's my high level motivation. Um, now I'm going to talk about two particular uh, works that we've recently done to try to get at this goal. So the first is actually a kind of practical tool uh, that uh, we've been developing. Uh, and the second is a paper that utilizes this tool uh, for practical ends. So I'll start with that. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we write code to build these sort of structured probabilistic models. So um, let's begin by getting a little technical. Um, in NLP, we love this function. Uh, the softmax function is kind of the most widely used function probably in all of NLP. And it does something pretty cool. It takes a vector uh, that we're going to call script L that can be kind of an arbitrary vector. And then it maps that vector onto the simplex. So it turns that point here onto a point in this uh, triangle down here. And by doing that, it basically allows us to transform any vector that we have into a probability distribution. Um, it, it gives us some vector where all the dimensions sum to one and all of them are uh, greater than zero. And the way we do this is quite simple. We exponentiate each one of the dimensions of L. And um, then uh, on the bottom, we uh, exponentiate this term called the log partition function. Um, and the log partition function is um, basically going to require being able to sum over all of these dimensions. Um, so this is the kind of core function. And the two pieces of terminology we're going to use are logit to refer to this vector script L and log partition to refer to this normalization. And the second thing we're going to have to play with is the fact that there's an important exponential family identity of the softmax function, which is that if we take the derivative of this log partition function with respect to any dimension of the logit that we're given in, we get back out the softmax value um, at that dimension. So basically, we can use this identity to take a derivative and use that derivative to get back one of the dimensions or the probability of a given dimension. So that kind of core identity and the use of softmax gets widely used in natural language processing. It's the uh, kind of main way we do multi-class classification. It's a tension, which is the, the main operation that gets used in transformer. And then it gets used in all other applications, such as any kind of discrete reinforcement learning or even forms of entropy regularization. Now, what I'm interested in is how do we extend this idea of a softmax to a set that may have combinatorial uh, number of elements? So in standard softmax, we may have a thick set of classes or a fixed number of words in our history that we want to attend to. But in a structured softmax, 
we're going to have a combinatorial set that we need to utilize for our distribution and give probabilities for each part of the process itself. And uh, probably most of the applications you're used to don't have this property. So standard things, like I said, multi-class classification or tension, there's a fixed number of elements. Here, we're gonna be computing distributions over say all binary trees or all alignments between words and languages or all different uh, forms of taggings for a sentence. So this uh, structured softmax has a name. Uh, we call it a conditional random field. Um, and the key property here is going to be that in a standard softmax, we map from logits through a partition function into probabilities. So that's the projection we've seen so far. And we utilize this identity that the, the derivative of this log partition function gives us back uh, the probability of an element. So that's what I'm showing here. You pass in some vector that corresponds to a score or logits you use softmax to map that to probability. In a CRF, we're going to instead do the same operation, but with slightly different shapes. We're going to take in log potentials. We're going to compute a, a log partition just as before. And we're going to use that to give us output marginals. And the output marginals are going to give us the probability of some event occurring in our distribution. So in particular, uh, the, uh, in the kind of previous setup, the logits represented a score for every possible element in our set, say the score for producing a given word or the score for producing a different sentiment in a multi-class classification setting. In a conditional random field, the log potentials are gonna be a score of some event occurring in our combinatorial set. So there'll be say the score of a node appearing in a tree or a score of there being an alignment between two words in two languages. And what we're gonna get out from that is a probability distribution that will then give us the probability of one of those events occurring in our output. So let's make that a little bit more tangible and look at some examples. Um, well, actually, so first I should say, um, uh, it, uh, in practice, what we're going to do is we're going to be building this operator into our language. Uh, this is through a toolkit known as TorchStruct. Uh, and we also have implementations of this in JAX as well. Um, and the idea is going to be to build in a CRF function into our code base uh, that allows us to compute these terms in the same way that you would compute a softmax. And I think what the library succeeds at is it makes a CRF as easy to use as a softmax and one of the research challenges we're looking into now is how, is how to make it as fast as a softmax as well. Um, and so just to give you an example, so what I'm showing on the right here is um, a structured softmax computed over the set of all possible trees over a sequence of length 1,000. So each one of these points represents the marginal probability of any span occurring in these trees. So this point here covers this area of the output and its uh, value corresponds roughly to its, the marginal probability of that aspect of the tree appearing. Okay, so let's make that a little bit more formal. So we're gonna start with a, a matrix where uh, when we wanna represent a tree like this one here, we'll represent each dot as being whether or not that position uh, occurred or that node occurred in the tree. So we're basically converting from a tree form to a matrix form. Uh, and this will be a one hot matrix that indicates uh, basically a brown dot when a node appeared and a, a pink background when that node doesn't appear. We're then going to take in as input a score for every node either appearing or not. So this matrix represents for every possible node that might appear in a tree, a color representing a score for that node appearing or not appearing. And this is a generalization of that L vector. It's the output of some neural network. For instance, maybe this is the output of a convolutional neural network or a transformer model uh, to produce these values. From these values, we're then going to turn it into a distribution over trees. So distribution over the combinatorial number of trees that might appear. 
Now the API for the library is pretty simple. We take in uh, a matrix here representing all the log potentials over our tree. We then uh, simply uh, ask for properties of that distribution. So if we want to find the best tree in this set, we simply ask for the argmax. If we want to sample, we simply sample some uh, trees from this distribution. And if we want to compute marginals, so marginals are the probability of each node appearing, we simply ask for the marginals from this model. Um, and this last step, computing the marginals, is really where we connect the two to our standard softmax. So these marginals really are the kind of generalization of what we get out from simply applying a softmax over our input uh, vector. Um, and this slide is both kind of what the library gives you and also the API for actually using the library itself. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, what would be fun to talk about next? So, um, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more kind of behind the scenes aspect of how this model works. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to provide the users. Let me talk about how we actually do it. Um, so the key idea is that for uh, any sort of combinatorial structure you might be interested in, we can write down the log partition function, the normalizing function of this distribution. And we can write that down by just computing it in our deep learning library. So here on the right is an example of how I would compute the log partition function or the sum over all trees uh, for our tree-based distribution. Uh, it's about uh, six lines of code, uh, but it computes a relatively complex dynamic programming algorithm known as the CKY algorithm in order to compute that term. Um, but one of the things that's really neat about having access to a framework that provides auto differentiation is that once we've computed that term, we can then apply standard mathematical identities to get the properties we want. So remember I told you at the beginning of this talk that computing the derivative of the log partition function with respect to one of the input elements returns that probability. Well, that's more than just an identity. It's something we can exploit directly with an auto differentiation framework. So if I want the marginals, if I want these terms here, all I have to do is sum up the scores of all possible trees under these log potentials and then call dot backwards or dot grad. That automatically gives me the marginals that I want. So really all this code here is doing is giving us the kind of full access to this discrete distribution. Now we can take this idea one step further, which is that if we replace what this A function means, uh, and we can do that by replacing some of the core operators that we compute in that sum. So in particular, switching from a plus and a times operator to a plus and a max operator, we can then use the same code to compute the score of the highest scoring sequence. And running auto differentiation on the score of the highest scoring sequence gives us the argmax sequence itself. So we actually get out the argmax sequence by calling dot backwards with a slight variant of that same code. And the same trick, in fact, works for getting samples from the model itself. So basically everything on this slide was just one piece of code to compute our log partition. And then three different ways of computing uh, our backward or our, our gradient term of that uh, function. And so all that gets done with just a single piece of code in the library. So let me um, kind of summarize uh, what the library provides. Um, we have implementations for the log partition function A for many different types of structured distributions. So we have kind of standard HMMs, factorial HMMs, uh, semi-Markov models, and all sorts of different tree models. And then each one of these models also works with different replacements of the log partition function. So for instance, let's consider alignment. So this is kind of a, 
classic approach for biological sequence alignment or for aligning different sounds. If I replace the log partition function for alignment with six different variants, then the derivatives I compute look like the following six outputs. So marginals gives us the rough probability of aligning each of the different positions. Argmax gives us the best alignment. Sampling produces a sample alignment. Uh, Multi-sample allows us to get many samples in the same code. Uh, Kmax produces the uh, K highest scoring alignments. And we can even use kind of new approaches that try to uh, basically change dynamic programming to give us uh, kind of better or easier to differentiate uh, types of output. So sparse max is a rough combination of argmax and marginals. Okay. Um, so in practice, um, we've been using this approach for various different applications. Um, I'll skip through this relatively quickly for now because I'm going to talk about one of the practical applications that we use. Um, the other interesting aspect of the library is we thought about how to make these approaches more efficient. So um, one of the challenges in using uh, structured softmax distributions is that we actually have to run a dynamic program in the middle of our log partition calculation. And so we have to be pretty careful about what sorts of underlying operations we use in order to make it efficient and scalable. Um, so here are some of the optimizations we use in the library. Let me talk about one of these in particular. Um, so uh, this is a particularly uh, fast way to compute uh, um, the log partition function of uh, a hidden Markov model on GPU. Um, and the idea is that if you've seen this function before, you've probably seen it implemented left to right. It often goes under the name, uh, the forward backward algorithm. But on GPU, you can implement this instead with an approach known as parallel scan. And the idea is instead of computing these terms left to right, you instead compute them uh, bottom up. At each position, you take your log potentials, merge them together, merge them together until you get finally your output uh, log partition function. Um, you can also imagine uh, basically a backward version of this approach that goes top to bottom. But in our framework, you don't actually ever need to implement that because once you have this term at the top, you just use auto differentiation to spread back down the tree and distribute the marginals. Um, so this is a really nice approach for computing uh, this term in an environment that you can compute terms in parallel. And in particular on GPU, you get a very nice implementation like the one here on the right of the slide. Cool. Um, so that's our library. Uh, you can get it and play with it. Uh, it's uh, super easy to install. So uh, here's roughly uh, how it works. You can just install it uh, from our GitHub. Uh, you can start it up and you can start building and uh, playing with some of the different libraries uh, directly. So here are trees and here are sequences. So uh, next I'd like to talk about one application that we utilize these approaches um, in. Uh, and this is a work known as the Markov Transformer. Uh, it's written by my student, uh, Yuntian Deng. So the research question here is uh, whether we can speed up decoding of realistic uh, deep learning based models by uh, controlling the dependency structure. So let me give a little bit of motivation for this task. So the task we're interested in is neural machine translation. Uh, we're going to be given a source sentence and we're gonna to wanna to produce a target translation. The classic way this approach is done is to build a model that conditions on all the previous target words, as well as the source, in order to produce the next target word in the sequence. This process is serial, uh, and people often approximate it with a method known as beam search. In recent years, there's been an alternative method that people have explored, known as non-autoregressive machine translation. The goal of this approach is that we'd like to generate each of the target words immediately. 
So we're going to assume that the target words are probabilistically independent. And we're going to uh, use an approach, or we're going to use this approach in order to get parallel inference in our target. So we'd like to just take our GPU and generate all the target words at the same time simultaneously. So the first approach is, uh, I think, a little bit more realistic for how language probably works. But the second approach is computationally very appealing. And uh, here's what these two approaches look like probabilistically. Uh, the first assumes independence, while the second allows full dependence on the target words. Now, our goal is going to try to say, how can we get parallel decoding uh, without making such a strong independence assumption? So we're going to assume that some of our target words are dependent on uh, past words, um, but that they're not dependent on all the previous words. And to do this, we're going to build up a probabilistic model. We're going to show how to do inference in this model. And finally, we're going to use the trick I just showed you in order to do fast decoding. So let's look at how that works. So the first idea is going to be a method for converting a fully uh, dependent translation model into a model that has explicit dependencies. So um, in particular, we're going to take a transformer model that normally attends to all the previous words. This is a model that looks like the one we saw at the beginning of this talk, but is broken up by these explicit green barriers that prevent the model from intending beyond a specific point. Now, to do this, we don't have to change any of the internal code of our model. We simply put in masks that prevent the model from looking past these green barriers. And in order to start this process, we simply uh, sample uniformly where the barriers begin in each sentence. One thing that's nice about this is that even though the model is trained with these barriers in fixed locations, at test time, we actually find that we're able to generate the words left to right. And as long as we don't go beyond the fixed length we trained on, the model works pretty well. So each word in our generative process is going to depend on a variable number of previous words, uh, which we can do even if we trained it with these kind of fixed barriers. OK, so the reason we do this is because by making these assumptions, we're then able to compute our log partition function over our translation in a reasonable amount of time. So in particular, we're going to use the trick I showed you earlier, which is to, in parallel, build up a tree where the top of the tree represents uh, the log partition function over all possible translations. And this differs significantly from the way that people tend to do translation. Instead of kind of building up our output in a left to right style, we're going to be building it up by building the structure in parallel. Um, and again, this sort of tree-based algorithm works very efficiently on GPUs. Cool. Uh, and this is just a diagram comparing it to Beam Search. Um, but the final problem is that even if we have this approach where we can build up our output structure in parallel. We still have the problem that there are just a lot of words in our target language. So our model is going to be um, dependent in its complexity on the number of words that we have to deal with at each point in time. So even if we build up this structure, we still have a very long list of these words below. And that's going to affect the runtime complexity of our model. So in order to even be able to run this approach, we have to be able to reduce our vocabulary somewhat. So in particular, we're going to scale uh, vocabulary to the amount of dependencies that we allow in the model. So we have to really get this factor of B down to a pretty low number for this at all to be efficient in practice. So we're going to do that using an approach known as cascade decoding. And the way cascade decoding works is that we're going to compute the marginal probability of a given word appearing using a very fast model, 
We're then gonna prune out the words that had very low probability of recurring and move to a slightly slower model. And we're gonna continue doing this until we produce a single translation for our given sentence. So here's what that looks like in practice. Um, okay, so I'm going to play this a couple of times. So the idea is we first start with all of the possible words, and we have to consider all sequence of those words to use them. We then prune to slightly fewer words, rescore, prune, rescore. So the first step in time, we're basically using a very simple uh, unigram model. We're scoring the likelihood of each word occurring in the unigram model. We're then moving to a bigram model, scoring each word, pruning, and then moving on to a trigram model. So as we increase the probabilistic dependencies in this approach, we're going to simultaneously be reducing the number of words that we are considering. In order to do this pruning, we're going to be using the marginalization approach, which I discussed in the first section. All of these calculations get calculated by running one step forward of the transformer and then running our tree-based marginalization in order to get the new scores. Um, cool. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what that looks like practically. So um, for a given example, you might start out with every position having a list of the top five words under a unigram model. So given a German sentence, here are the top five unigrams at each position. We then consider all possible bigrams. But once we consider all possible bigrams, we expand the number of possibilities that exist. So we consider all combinations of these. But then we prune those down to the five most likely bigrams under our model. So we basically get five at each position like this. Here, uh, uh, slash s is end of sentence and the dash means that it's just padding because it's after the end of a sentence token. We then continue building up a more powerful model, but considering fewer number of words. So here are the basically five possible trigrams that occur at each position. And then here are the five possible foregrams. Uh, and at this point in time, we finish and produce our translation. Cool. Um, so let's see what my time is, a couple more minutes. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the results of this approach. So it, for this approach, we're doing translation. And recall that our baseline models are going to be non-autoregressive translation models. So these are other approaches that try to take in a sentence and spit out a translation directly. So some of these approaches are models that use um, uh, flows, models that try to use refinement, uh, some models that try to use RL or other approaches to make this work. Um, and our experiments were done on a, a relatively small translation data set, IWSLT, and then two larger data sets, WNP. Uh, our code is released and available and it's built atop of the awesome uh, FairSeq translation library. One other point that's interesting is that for all these approaches, there are two ways to do it. One is to just train directly on the data set. The other is to use a, an approach known as sequence distillation, where you first train a, a, a strong translation model without these constraints, and you use it to regenerate your training data. So you literally run it on your training data and have it spit out its translations. And then you train your faster model on that output. Uh, and, and it turns out that doing that actually gives a uniform boost across many of these different models and is basically for free uh, a way to make your model better. Cool. So just to give you a sense, uh, so on IWSL T, uh, the best transformer model gets around here, about 34. The baseline approach we compared to is all the way down here at about 25. Uh, this is all measured in terms of blue score, which is the standard metric for a translation. Um, and we're able to get about a four times speed up without losing a kind of significant amount from our, our baseline model. 
Uh, so the way we produce different stars is based on the number of steps we run the model for. So uh, this first star, it basically only runs with the unigram model, whereas these later stars consider more of the probabilistic dependencies between words. Um, and then, as I said, if we instead apply the same approach, but we regenerate our training data with uh, a very strong model, then all of these stars go up higher. You can get a much larger speed up, uh, basically just by changing your training process. Cool. Um, and results are a little less strong on some of the uh, bigger models, uh, or sorry, bigger data sets. Um, uh, it turns out that it's just a slightly harder problem uh, to uh, kind of generate in this, in this parallel style. Um, but our model is um, uh, stronger than a lot of baselines. Um, it can sometimes be hard to compare speed because these run on slightly different uh, computational setups. Um, this one method, uh, this green dot here, seems to be slightly better. That's an RL-based method that came out of FAIR. Um, but we weren't able to kind of compare directly apples to apples uh, with that approach. Cool. Um, let me um, talk a little bit about some of the, the interesting properties of this approach. So one thing that's interesting about using a structured approach is that we're actually able to explore many more examples. So uh, these graphs show on average how many different possible translations our model considered. Um, so uh, there's a kind of trade-off between looking, uh, kind of having a richer model versus exploring fewer examples. So this model to the right is the kind of standard way people do translation. And that method works by basically looking at uh, only 100 possible uh, outputs, but building them up left to right with a very strong uh, and global model. Um, whereas our approaches, because they kind of build up these, um, these squares uh, from a bottom-up uh, fashion, end up being able to explore many different possible translations, uh, even though they, they use less of the, the history in order to score them. Uh, so this uh, graph here corresponds to basically the number of squares that end up getting explored in, um, in this final step of this model. So the number of, uh, number of examples that get to that point. Um, cool. Um, and then finally, you might ask how it is that a model that doesn't have any dependencies between output words is able to produce translations at all. And uh, one issue that, that seems obvious is like, how does it know where to put a versus an in English. If it can't see the next word, how could it possibly know what word to put in a given position? And, uh, and in practice, actually, a lot of these models aren't that good at, at, at doing that problem. One issue they, they often have is that they repeat a lot of words. So if you have a model that only looks at unigrams, this is a model that's fully non-autoregressive, um, it it's only producing about 80% unique words, which means that there's about 20% repeats uh, in the model itself. Um, oh, sorry, I have the graph backwards. Uh, this is a model that, oh, sorry, a after, <laughs> sorry. This, so this is the unigram model. So the, the unigram model basically has 50% non-unique words. Um, in the process. But after five epochs of our approach, that goes down to only about 15% about, uh, here. Uh, and this is repeats of bigrams, trigrams, and fourgrams. Uh, so basically, this point, this column, shows that a model that's fully non-autoregressive is basically allowing a, a lot of repeats or kind of, uh, kind of non-standard things to get through, whereas just refining with higher level um, uh, approaches or kind of richer models does better on that problem. Great. Um, I'll skip this for now. Um, so I think to conclude, um, this talk was about how 
deep learning is an incredibly useful black box approach to classification and parameter estimation. Uh, but that I think inherently real problems are going to need some form of model control and explicit dependencies. Um, but I also don't think we should go fully in the opposite direction and, and, and try to build systems that, that kind of are strictly enforce uh, kind of meaningless dependencies. Uh, the, the goal of my work and, and the things I'd love to chat about are how you can build systems that take into account the way that deep learning works, take into account kind of the structure that it has, but also pull out some of the useful and necessary dependencies that we would like for practical problems. Uh, so I think PyTorch uh, struct allows you to do that in practice and our research tries to make use of that on realistic applications. Cool, uh, I think I'm over time, so I will end there. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Sasha. Really interesting talk. Uh, I'm gonna hand the discussion over to Max now, um, but also just to remind you guys that um, if you put your questions into the QA, um, then we're gonna we're gonna either read them out or if you put your hand up, we're also gonna give you the opportunity to ask your question yourself. Um, so just put your hand up if you if you want to ask a question yourself. Um, uh, and yeah, if you you can use the chat by the way to communicate with the panelists. Um, that's that's us for. Uh, if you have any other questions, but if you want to ask a, a question of Sasha, then you should use the QA function. So um, yeah, Max, thanks very much for uh, coming along uh, to, to facilitate the discussion. So uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks again for the talk, Sasha. This is really uh, fascinating work. Uh, so we have a question in the QA uh, from Momchil uh, Konstantinov. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, read the question out loud, maybe? Sure. Um... So the question is, I was wondering about getting argmaxes as gradients. Does this rely on any specific conventions which Autodiff uh, Auto uses to differentiate through non-differentiable functions such as max? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. Um, so in practice, uh, PyTorch will uh, default to using um, the uh, argmax one hot vector as uh, whenever possible as the subgradient of the max function. So in practice, all we do is we just utilize that convention. Um, however, I, I understand why that's non-satisfactory. Um, and so we have a couple other examples where we do something different. So for instance, to compute samples, we're going to basically use the same code, but just define a different backward function for uh, the way to compute the chain rule for our softmax. So in particular, if we define the backward function of uh, basically the log partition function to instead of give a probability distribution, but instead to draw a one hot sample, then you can show that this gives you a sample from the distribution of interest. So uh, in the library itself, we're often overriding these backward functions in order to get the kind of convention that we would like. Um, and uh, this really does correspond to basically writing custom backward algorithms in a kind of classic dynamic programming sense. Uh, and so we do this for sampling. And then we also have methods that do this uh, as a way of computing kind of Gumbel softmax style uh, outputs from these structured distributions. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so if, if anyone else has more questions, feel free to, uh, to add them to the Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I was just wondering in terms of uh, the computational efficiency and kind of how, how these approaches scale uh, in terms of the, the, in terms of torch struct. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's in any way dependent on the, on the structure of the problem. Say you, if you wanted to apply this to say a summarization where you might have longer range dependencies than machine translation, uh, how would that affect things? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, all of these algorithms have different computational complexity. Um, and uh, it will depend on which algorithm you utilize. Um, so in the torch struct paper, we have a table that, um, uh, let's see, um, that goes through the computational complexity of each of the different approaches. So uh, here are all the different approaches and roughly um, their practical speed and their uh, scaling. Uh, 
So uh, algorithms like parsing are going to scale uh, pretty poorly with length, um, whereas algorithms like uh, some of the sequence algorithms will scale uh, pretty efficiently. Um, so there are, there are two goals that I have. One is finding kind of problems where this uh, is already pretty efficient. So in the problem I described for translation, we found that the inference was actually trivial. It was a very small amount of the time compared to transformer. So the kind of trade-off between inference time versus the transformer itself, it didn't make a big deal. The other thing we've been looking into are ways to really speed this up at a, a kind of low level CUDA level. So um, there's a lot of computation that goes into these calculations. That's just kind of overhead of calling uh, these low level functions. But we think with kind of, uh, I think these sort of algorithms are much more able to be uh, kind of compiled or, or uh, basically jitted. So kind of new approaches like uh, JAX and XLA, which are kind of compilers for arbitrary mathematical code. Um, let's see an example here. Um, some of these transformations that we implemented manually, uh, such as uh, the forward backwards I showed earlier, or custom code for uh, computing the log partition, they'll, they'll get automatically a, a compiled in modern languages. So I think some of the compilers people are building will make these a lot faster to run in practice. Awesome. Um, I mean, following up on that, uh, traditionally structured prediction approaches have been quite, quite difficult to, to implement. And this library seems to make it a lot more accessible. I'm just wondering if you had any kind of uh, off the cuff ideas of where it might uh, initially be most, most applicable. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, um, I, I can talk about some of the applications we've done. Um, I can also talk about applications others have done. So uh, one work that we recently uh, produced that I thought was quite interesting was we built a giant hidden Markov model. So uh, there's a lot of talk about how hidden Markov models are much worse than recurrent neural networks at sequence prediction. But our theory was that they're just much smaller. So we thought, how could we go about building the largest hidden Markov model that we could? So we built a model with 64,000 states uh, and trained it with an embedding-based parameterization. Uh, and we found that while we couldn't beat the kind of best LSTMs, we did much better by like hundreds of perplexity points than anyone had on the task before. Uh, so we thought that was a kind of fun example. Uh, another example is we've been very interested in unsupervised uh, grammar induction. Um, and um, this is, a, I guess, less of a practical problem. But the question is how, from text, you can discover the grammar of a language. Uh, and we built a system using uh, Torchstruck and uh, VAE that lets you discover, uh, basically, from scratch, the hidden structure of uh, language. Um, and recently, there was a very interesting paper from Edinburgh that used the same uh, library to try to infer grammar from images. So it was kind of visually grounded uh, grammar induction, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we've got a question from uh, John Reed. Uh, John is asking, uh, I was wondering about when Sasha mentioned calculating the partition function. Isn't that impractical, impractical for combinatorial structures of any reasonable size? Yeah, so let me be let me be really clear. Um, it would be impractical to sum up all of the trees directly. If we were assuming that any tree could have a, uh, its own personalized scoring function. In a conditional random field, we're going to assume that the scoring function factors into scores of each of the individual parts. So in particular, for trees, we're going to assume that we only have a score for every node, and that the score of a tree is going to be the sum of the scores of each of the nodes. If we make that assumption, then we can use dynamic programming to 
get the sum over all trees. And in fact, this is the algorithm that does it. It sums over all trees because it assumes each of the scores factor into individual nodes. So this algorithm, uh, the CKY algorithm, gives us the log partition function in polynomial time. So similarly, uh, this approach here is a version of the forward backwards algorithm or particularly the forward algorithm. And the forward algorithm is gonna sum over uh, a Markov structure where we assume that there's some sort of either uh, bigram or trigram Markov structure in order to compute the exact log partition over that set. So the set has an exponential number of elements, but the sum of the probabilities is going to be computed in polynomial time. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, John, for the, the question. And again, any, any further questions, uh, please do add them to the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I have a few more questions about the, the Markov transformers. Um, you mentioned the uh, sequence distillation uh, giving some, some performance improvements. I was wondering, it seems like the, the architecture isn't actually too different from uh, traditional pre-trained transformers. I was wondering if there was any way you could maybe uh, distill pre-trained language models into uh, Markov transformers and kind of uh, tap into the or access, uh, you know, what pre-trained language models have already maybe uh, learned. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so I should make one distinction, which is that translation differs slightly from a pre-trained language model like GPT-2 because it is conditional. So you're conditioning on some source and producing some output. There are conditional uh, pre-trained models like BART and Pegasus. And those models have been very effective for some tasks like uh, summarization. They're a little less effective for translation, but there has been some work along those lines. Um, the question is, how can you distill a model like BART or Pegasus? Um, we have a paper about this, actually. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's called, uh, let's see, uh, Distilling Pre-trained Summarization. Um, great. So uh, this is on the archive. And this is work that was done at Hugging Face. And in particular, this paper tries to get at this question of how to best distill these sort of sequence to sequence pre-trained models for practical use. So how can you take a model that's giant like Pegasus and use it for a given task? Um, I think the next step of this sort of work would be to distill it into a non regressive form or distill it into a Markov transformer form. Uh, for now, we're still just figuring out the details of how to distill it to be small to be useful in practice. But I think that would be a really nice next step. One thing that's nice about distillation is you don't just have to distill it to be small, you can distill it to have certain properties that you want. And if you're, if you're interested in distillation, I actually also just recorded a workshop talk on the history of these kind of distillation approaches and I can post it in the, the chat. It's also on my, my Twitter if you're interested. Yeah, fantastic, thanks, that would be, that'd be great. Um, okay, yeah, um, again, feel free to uh, raise your hands, uh, post any questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, Big question, actually, uh, Max, for, for Sasha. We, you know, how, Sasha, how, how should we think, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're kind of leveraging in, in TorchStruct, you're, you're sort of using the uh, auto differentiation kind of uh, uh, machinery to, to get these speed ups um, for, for things like HMM forward backward algorithms. How, how should we think about how, what kind of performance you get compared to some traditional, like very specialized tuned um, HMM toolkit? Um, what, 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 what kind of speed ups can we expect? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at the moment, I think I'm probably not beating, let's see. Uh, let me start from the beginning. So one aspect that's very neat about these approaches is that you get to utilize the GPU and hopefully in the future TPU. So a lot of the work on kind of customized HMMs is kind of targeting CPU. Um, the other aspect that's nice about this is you can 
embed your HMM within a neural network. So I don't break any of the other auto differentiation framework. So you can just backprop through the HMM directly. So that lets you do some neat things. So you can kind of use an HMM like it was attention or things like that. In terms of practical speed up, HMM is a particularly interesting case because it has been so optimized. We, we've been doing some work recently of writing kind of just custom HMMs in CUDA, which I think would be kind of ideal. HMMs is like you really want to make fast. Uh, so I think that would be interesting. Um, the other thing that I should mention is that we're really customized to like dense HMMs. So I know that a lot of the kind of uh, toolkits will do things like pruned HMMs or like finite state automata, things like that. Because we're targeting GPU, it's really critical that we have pretty like strong block structure in order to uh, kind of get some of the GPU based speed ups, if, if that makes sense. So I didn't, I didn't uh, give a direct answer. I guess I should do some more benchmarking to give you a <laughs> Uh, so we've got uh, a comment from John, uh, basically thanking you for the answer to the previous question and uh, saying, now I'm wondering what size sequences I could expect to run uh, Needleman Wunsch on. I don't know, maybe you want to say anything. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so Needleman Wunsch keeps me up at night. That is like the hardest algorithm to implement on GPU. Um, I've tried so hard. Um, I can get to like 400, 500, and I just start blowing up my GPUs. Um, Again, I think if you're going to make assumptions about how far apart different things in Needleman Wunsch can be, like kind of gap assumptions, then you can do slightly better. But honestly, I'm not happy with how PyTorch works for Needleman Wunsch. Um, so uh, unfortunately, that's one that I don't have a great answer yet, but I hope to do better on in the future. I really want to backprop through that. And I think like, I don't, I don't know, but like when I read the, the like this deep mind paper on like new alpha fold, they, they clearly are doing some sort of multi-sequence alignment. So I wonder if they have kind of toolkits for this in practice. I, I, it just seems really like it would be very neat to have. Um, let me, uh, I can show you a little bit about what I've tried so far for Needleman once. So, um, um, so this is the this is our, our repo of like CUDA structures to utilize. So in particular, we, we kind of implemented a, like a banded sparse version for it to try to get some of the structure faster. So so we use this as the way we do Neum and Wunsch, uh, and then you can try it out in the code um, to do it. Again, this is another algorithm that like has been super optimized, not on GPU by lots of toolkits. So I, I don't know exactly how they compare uh, in practice, but we can, well, I, I guess I'll just point, point you to the docs to try it out. So, uh, so yeah, so here are, here, here are the docs for, for, for alignment. You basically give it in um, uh, basically uh, tensors that give you all of the different alignment probabilities, and it will spit out these things. Max, um, I think maybe time for one more question. Cool. Uh, sounds good. Uh, then let's go with uh, Jamong's question. Uh, so Jamong is asking, how could these methods be applied to regression problems, such as certain tasks in text-to-speech, where you output to a continuous space instead of performing classification? Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a great answer. Um, uh, I know that in text to speech, sometimes people use like um, RNN transformer, uh, RNN. Yeah, I think they're called RNN transformers, but they're like FSA RNNs. That would be one interesting area. Uh, it would also be interesting to consider uh, algorithms like um, Kalman filters or kind of state space models that have some aspect of continuous space as well as um, discrete space. Um, so I think that would be an interesting area to explore. Um, another thing I've seen in text-to-speech is people have been recently trying 
more non-autoregressive approaches, uh, kind of similar approaches to what the Markov transformer tries, um, but, uh, but in a text-to-speech domain. So I think it'd be really interesting to try something like the Markov transformer, where it's a text-to-speech model where you only condition on a certain amount of the previous speech in order to produce uh, your output. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting area to explore. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, so this, just to let everyone know, this this talk, like all of our talks uh, is recorded. Um, it will go up on our YouTube channel. So if you just search for London Machine Learning Meetup on YouTube, uh, and if you subscribe, then you're going to get to hear about when we uh, upload the new talks. Uh, and also if you if you connect to me on Twitter, um, at Martin Goodson, uh, you'll also find out. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming along. And thank you so much, Sasha Rush. Max Bartolo, thank you so much for the for the talk and a really interesting discussion. And um, see you guys next time. Thanks a lot.